So I'm Paula Getz. I'm the founder of New Mexico New. And just want to introduce a little bit of our core team here. And I'll introduce the speakers in a minute. So I uh, want to talk about all of our events are supported by seniors. And we have Jillian, one of the senior coaches uh, uh, on today. And we really, if you don't know about seniors, they, they, they have a great purpose. They use seniors tech savvy teens to empower seniors with technology and all of us all of us because this technology changes so much we need that help so they're a great partner of ours we really appreciate it and then um we uh will do a little bit of introduction of new mexico new basically in january 2021 we created new mexico new it stands for new elder world we're a uh, nonprofit on a mission to engage and proactively reach out to 50 to 70 year olds to re so that we can remain engaged and encourage us to share our wisdom, our experience and our life experience with our communities. We plan to provide three pathways of engagement. One of them's this, the learning events. The other two, um, are in the future. And one of them is to provide a way for us to find part-time jobs or volunteer at a nonprofit. So that's the app we were talking about in the slides. And the last one is a way to connect socially with each other. So the date of when those will be available will depend on the funding that we're currently uh, raising to build them. So stay tuned. All right, so let's get started with today's event. And, and um, I wanna introduce, we're so lucky to have them. Um, Bob and Bob and Elaine Grassberger. <clears throat> well, they've lived in New Mexico since 1979, and they have two fabulous daughters and six grandbabies. So uh, then they range from three to 18 years old, which uh, I know they probably say, "I can't believe we have grandbabies that 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 old." So Elaine ran a large orthodontics office for 17 years, and then. I really admire this. She returned to school at age 51 to become a special education teacher. And then she retired from teaching in 2019. Bob spent most of his career in economic and workforce development. He taught for several years at UNM and is an emeritus faculty member, having retired in 2015. I am going to start recording. Thank you. Um, both of them serve on boards as volunteers. And the Grassburgers own a company called Who Am I Next? Very appropriate for them to talk today. It's a firm devoted to helping others successfully transition to retirement. So over the last seven years, they have put on uh, numerous events and workshops. And that's how I met them was at one of the early events they'll talk about. And then they, both of them are really pretty responsible for New Mexico New Existing. In November 2019, they came and saw me and said, we want to talk to you. And I had this idea called Off Ramp that they knew about. And they just kept nudging me saying, you got to start working on getting that, that stood up and going. And so that's what became New Mexico New. So the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to them is happy anniversary. So today is their wedding anniversary. We are so privileged to have them share that with, with us. And so, yeah, happy anniversary. So, yeah, so well, thank you. Thank you, yep. Paul. Am I, am I up? Are we up? We're up. I will turn it over to you. All right. All right. Well, thanks again, Paul. I very much appreciate it. It's, it's been fun to work with you over the last uh, years on some of the things that we've seen come to fruition in New Mexico. And actually, we're going to talk about several things that were nothing but ideas in people's heads and then all of a sudden have come to fruition as well. Um, I do want to tell you guys that it is our anniversary today and we were calculating this morning, we were doing that math, trying to figure out how many years. We would not have actually known it was our anniversary had we not gotten text messages from our daughters indicating that it was uh, <laughs> anniversary day. Um, the other thing that has, has just been kind of fascinating this morning is we decided, and some of my friends that are here today are very musical, Elaine and I decided that we were going to take up ukulele, just something to do for fun. And so for our anniversary, we ordered two ukuleles, but we also do a lot of weightlifting. So we also ordered a 30 pound kettlebell. kettlebell. And apparently somebody at Amazon decided to put all of those in the same box. 
So this morning we received a kettlebell and some tinder for starting a fire with. So anyway, what a way to start off your anniversary, right? It's okay. So um, as Paula indicated, I retired in December of 2015 from UNM uh, as a professor there. And uh, just because we have done this quite a bit, I want to define how we, what we say retirement is, because we, we had a lot of trouble initially when we started this because people were like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. So here's the way we define re retirement. It's just a change in your relationship with paid work. So we've seen some people that retire on Friday and on Monday, they're back in the same chair as a consultant. We've seen some people who retire and they, they never come back. I'm one of those guys that I retired from one job, but I continue to I've continued to be involved in the community and, and uh, at work out there. Uh, so again, that's just for for background. Um, so as a start, when I retired, I was I did the standard thing for two weeks. You know, you fish, you, you play a little golf, and then you go, well, what am I going to do? I'm way too young to be sitting around. So I was having lunch with a couple of my friends who are here today, Bill Matter and Steve Tetroff. And we were just kind of talking about that it's really an awful place to be, to feel like when you've retired, that you've moved out of the asset column and into the liability column. And so we thought we should put on an event and help people think about what are the possibilities post-retirement. And so this slide that's up right now shows the first event that we put on in 2016. And, and again, this was just three guys having lunch that decided we should do this. But unfortunately, when Bob has an idea, lots of people get dragged in, or maybe fortunately, I don't know. Uh, so we also have to recognize that uh, Julie Zider from CNM and at the time Alexis Kirshner Tappen from CNM, they really helped us stand this up, uh, as did Larry Lee. Larry Lee uh, probably wondered. I called cold called him and said, hey, guy, I hear you're uh, helping people move into nonprofit work. And he's like, who are you? And I said, no, you're going to be putting on an event with us. Maybe we'll even get you to speak there. Um, so so uh, that's kind of where we started. And we put on this first event and we had help from AARP, from Gienza Valencia Sapien. And then if you guys look here, we had the world's most fabulous MC. MC, John Garcia, John Garcia came in and MC the thing. And at the time, our keynote, um, who, who did this with us, was Alan Weber, who was the soon to become mayor of, of Santa Fe. So this is what we rolled out. Now, one of the things that we do when we put on an event is we always do evaluations. We always want to assess what did people want, what was what was good, what was bad, what did people want differently. And the thing that we actually walked away from this event was that we probably didn't give enough people. People wanted personal stories. They wanted to know how people had transitioned into retirement. And the other thing that they that they pushed back on this event, and some of you will remember, is we had a woman that talked about making your last arrangements, and they were a lot of people were not thrilled about hearing about dying. So, so that was kind of a, a little bit of a, a bummer. So we put on a second event a year later um, because we had, and that first event we pulled 150 people from scratch. So I mean, it really was a big event. Um, we put on a second event in concert with CNM this time and and AARP again. And uh, at this event, we did that thing where we had speakers share their ideas of how they transition, uh, their stories of how they transition. And one of them was my lovely wife. So Bob talked about how he pulls people in uh, when he has these projects. So he came to me and, and asked if I'd be willing to share my story, which Paula gave you a little bit of that already. And as a matter of fact, this is the first time I met Paula was at this, this particular event. Um, so I did. I retired from managing an orthodontic practice that was in the Northeast Heights and had the opportunity to retire at 51 and jumped at the opportunity. And then for 90 days, I did all of those chores that I always told myself I would do if I ever retired. I organized the closets. I cleaned everything out, made numerous trips to Goodwill and to Habitat, donating things. 
And I knew I was in trouble when I got around to alphabetizing the spices. I said to Bob, all right, I, I have got to find something else to do. And so I went to Bob and I said, I, I, I'm trying to figure out what's next. And he said to me, well, what have you always wanted to do? And I said, yeah, but some of the, the thing I really want to do, I said, you know, I, it would take a lot of time. I'm, I'm already 51 years old. And Bob said, put all of that aside and do what it is that you're passionate about doing. So at 51, um, I went back to school to become a special ed teacher, which is what has always been a passion of mine since I was in high school. And so that was kind of the story that I shared at this second event is that this opportunity to reinvent your career, reinvent yourself. And, and we actually had a, one of Larry Lee's colleagues, colleagues as well, who was at the Center for Nonprofit Excellence at the time, who talked about her transition from the private sector into the volunteer world sector. Um, so it, it was quite an event as well. It pulled up 100 people as well. And um, the feedback out of that event uh, most interestingly was, hey, that's great. We love the stories. This was really uplifting. But how do we do it? How do we make this happen? The other big uh, uh, learning experience for me was that my friend Bill Matter shot pictures from behind me of my wife, and I learned that I'm losing my hair. So that was the other big epiphany at that point. Um, so, so with this idea that people said, how do we do this? We developed a series of workshops, of two-hour workshops called, hey, I'm retiring, now what? And I did these again with uh, with Steve, Bill, and Elaine. We we put these together at uh, UNM through UNM Continuing Education, and uh, um, they were quite successful. Probably something we ought to do again. I actually have been, you know, of course, uh, this is about the time that COVID starts to step in, right? Mm -hmm. And and so things kind of go by the wayside. Uh, but this is probably something we'll either do again through Oasis or through OLLI or, or through UNM Continuing Ed. Um, but because we were doing this, Elaine and I decided that we need, needed additional training as well. And so in about almost to the date uh, today, in 2019, we went to UNC Asheville, U University of North Carolina Asheville, to their OLLI uh, group and took a course. What was it called? It was called um, Path to Creative Retirement. They had um, it was a three day event and they had speakers that had gone through the program themselves and then come in and do special segments. Um, one of them was like on location. Are you in the right location for considering retirement? Um, they talked about what are your interests? What would you be passionate about pursuing in a in a after you retire? Um, they also had a really wonderful segment on social connections and how the important that would become in retirement. So, so uh, it's really a neat little class. And actually, we're, we have reached out to them to go back. It's not inexpensive, but we've reached out to them to go back. Um, they have been on hiatus since COVID. We were the last class in. They have not done a class, a face-to-face -face class since. Uh, it, about 30 people attend. Mm -hmm. And so our takeaway from this class was pretty interesting. It was filled with predominantly professional people, doctors, mm -hmm. lawyers, architects. Um, and, and the interesting thing was, is that those people were heavily wrapped in their identity. They literally were mm -hmm. uh, tied to, what will I do? I'm, I, I've always been a doctor. What, what could I do otherwise? And so Actually, that's where the name from our for our next company came up. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that people didn't know what to do post retirement mm -hmm. because I've always been a doctor. Uh, you know, what am I going to do next? Um, so, so that's kind of where we have landed in terms of how we've gotten here today. Now, remember, I told you that I'm not a very retired retired guy. So. In addition to what we had been doing at the same time, I was working with my, my friend and colleague, uh, John Garcia, uh, on how to attract retirees to New Mexico because retirees actually represent a very substantial economic uh, development strategy because they come here, they've got in income, mailbox income, and they come here and they spend like tourists, right? 
But they also, and Paula, this is uh, relates to y'all, they also bring their intellectual capital. And then often what we see is that when people move from one state to another, they 10 to 12% of them start their own companies. Others move into volunteer work. So again, this was something that John and I and a, and a friend of ours, uh, Charles Lehman, decided that we would pursue and eventually got some funding to do it. Out of that came the website that I just showed you, which by the way, Jillian, uh, are, is that resource list up that I that I wanted to post a, a resource list? Can you post, post that in chat, a link to it or something? Because uh, we did these three publications with New Mexico State with my uh, with my co-author uh, Dr. Jay Lily White, and all about attracting retirees to New Mexico. And and the reason I talked about the resource list is they are linked on that resource list if you're interested. And the cool thing about writing your own publications is that if you want, you get to figure out whose pictures go in it, <laughs> right? So. Um, you guys might recognize these people, although they have sunglasses, so maybe not. Vaguely so. familiar. Vaguely familiar. All right. So Bob's mom was one of those people that was just eternally young. And this was a, one of her favorite quotes that she was always telling us, that we everyone has to age, but growing old is a choice that you make. She truly in, embodied that. And so... Um, we kind of we kind of run with this because my mom was kind of this uh, had embodied this idea, and uh, here's what we have typically taught around um, this this particular slide is one we put together, but it's a composite that comes from a book by Richard Leiter, who I'll talk about a lot today, uh, and Alan Weber was the co-author on that, but also from uh, AARP from Joanne Jenkins. And typically when we teach our classes, the ones that I talked about that we did at Continuing Ed, the workshops, we built around these four triangles at the top. Do, what, am I, do I have the right purpose? Am I with the right people? Am I doing the right work? And am I at the right place? These are the non-financial aspects of transitioning to retirement. But note that this pyramid stands on top of a foundation of health and wealth. If you don't have your health, it's kind of irrelevant. And if you don't have your wealth, if you don't have enough wealth, you, you probably can't do some of the things that you'd like to do in retirement. Now, Paula and New Mexico New have done a series of, of uh, workshops and presentations, especially in the wealth. Um, uh, I, I can't remember her name, but the woman from uh, Anderson uh, has done. And those videos are up at the New Mexico new website. So right. talking about what we need to do in terms of wealth management. Right. Um, and it was Professor Riley White from UNM. We were very lucky to get, get them to talk. Yeah, thanks, Paul. You know what, Paul? I'm going to mention other names that I don't know either. So I'm going to be dependent on you. So pay, no pay problem, Bob. Pay, I got pay, you. Pay attention. Um, so historically, what we had done is we'd skipped over these bottom two sections. We said these are the domain of other people. The, you know, these are the domain of uh, uh, CFPs and, and uh, accountants and, and doctors. But then as we begin to look at this over the last three years, we realized that health is not just the domain of doctors. Health is a proactive choice mm -hmm. that you make. And, and that's kind of where we're going to go today with this idea of squaring the curve. Now, again, we're not medical doctors. Um, so, you know, as the stuff that we talk about, you know, if, you, if, you, if we're talking about exercise, make sure you check with your doctor first. That's my <laughs> caveat. Um, disclaimer. My disclaimer. <laughs> but again, this is kind of a departure for us from the, the stuff that we typically talk about. So, you know, Elaine, I, I hear life is risky. It is. How risky is it, Elaine? It's so risky, nobody gets out alive. All right. So I promised you I wasn't <laughs> going to talk about death, and here I go. Um, one of the things that we know is life is terminal. I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so um, we all kind of have a curve that we form. And if, I don't know if you all remember, there was a song several years ago by John Cougar Mellencamp, where he started out, it was a little ditty about Jack and Diane. Here's a little ditty of Jack and Diane. <laughs> well, today our little ditty is about Bob and Diane. So I just wanted to stick that in your head so that song would be stuck in your head for the rest of the day. So I, I wanted to explain that for our ditty, we are using Bob's parents because their, their quality of life curves are the two 
perfect examples of the two curves that we're going to talk about here. So let me tell you first a little bit about Bob. Um, Bob was a Kansas boy. He In high school, he set his sights to go to West Point, and he made that happen through focus and determination. He went on to have a stellar career in the military. And all through his 40s, he was fit, he was lean. But then in his 50s, he had a couple of health challenges and started putting on weight. His exercise slowed down. And so we saw this cycle of putting on weight and loss of mobility. And what we saw was this slow, steady decline where his quality of life was very poor towards the end. Um, and this continued until he eventually passed away. So it was for it was for a very long, long time. time, and it was painful not only for him because he was a very proud man. He was a West mm -hmm. Pointer. I mean, um, and so he had to have people maintaining it, helping him get in and out of bed. His his uh, muscle had declined where he couldn't walk anymore without assistance. Um, and, and literally, by the time he died, he was twice he weighed twice what he weighed when he was in his forties. Mm -hmm. He literally put on that much weight. Does anybody know anybody that's on this curve? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Anybody know anybody that lives on, that's on this curve? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is kind of the common curve in America actually. And it's actually a mindset, what we expect to, to see. Here's the second little ditty. So this is a ditty about Diane. Um, Diane was raised on the East coast. She was a dancer. She was a cheerleader. Those People that you meet that brighten a room when they walk into it, that was Bob's mom. Um, and she always had this attitude. And remember her telling us when we were like in our 20s, I'm going to live till I die. And we were just mystified with what on earth that, that could possibly mean. Um, and so, so she was always lean. She was always active. And then in her 50s, she also had a couple of health challenges. But the difference was she bounced right back. Her weight never went up and she got right back into being active. Um, she never slowed down. Yeah. And so this curve actually shows that squared curve. And literally, you can see, I mean, I drew this by hand, so that's why it's an <laughs> ugly curve. But you can see that uh, that actually hers bumped up. And we truly see this. There's a bunch of literature out there on happiness that shows happiness goes up after age 50, that our happiness actually increases uh, after age 50 and continues up after age 70. Interestingly, the bottom of the happiness curve is about age 41. Well, and what we saw with, with Diane was she had this amazing quality of life. And then we went to a family reunion. A few days later, she complained of a, a stomach ache, went to the hospital. A few days after that, she was gone. Uh, she, and what do we call this, Bob? This, we call this the Thelma and Louise <laughs> exit, where you drive along and you're happy and you're enjoying yourself and doing all kinds of interesting things. And then one day you just drive off the cliff. So so um, that's kind of, that's the, the two stories. So. This is the idea that that we gleaned this from. And, and I initially saw this in an article um, by the McKinsey Group, by the consulting firm of McKinsey. And they were talking about it in a sense of global wellness, that we could do this with global wellness. And, and so I lifted it. I was like, well, why couldn't we do that individually? And, and why couldn't we make that happen? If you look at this, you know, the average course of life, this is the American lifestyle. And frankly, I do believe it's a mindset. I think it's it's what we expect. But in reality, if you think about it, you actually know some people that that live this squared curve, this more squared curve. For example, in the in the resource list, there's a book by a guy named Chris Conley. I think that's his Crowley, maybe. Um, and and he is now 88 years old, and it's called it's called Younger Next Year. He is 88 years old and still skiing the black diamonds. So, I mean, there are all kinds of people that you know like this. So this was kind of our premise, kind of our research premise on this mm -hmm. was how do we square this curve? How do we lift it and at the same time extend it? And that was the kind of the research question we started out with then.
One of the things we know from doing a lot of research is that if you want to find out, success leaves clues. Go find people who have done what it is that you want to do or what you want to learn about. And there are two very well-known studies out there. There are dozens, but there are two that are very well-known that we want to kind of run you down here for a second just to, to get you familiar with them. The first one is what's called the Harvard study, the Harvard study of eight, adult aging or something, or sometimes called the Grant study. And the Harvard study is a longitudinal study. So in other words, they, they got a group of people and they tracked that group of people over their, the entirety of their lives. The, the thing that's fascinating about this study is that it was started in 1940. And so they it is the longest longitudinal study in the U.S. at this point. They started with, it's called the Harvard study because they started with um, 270 sophomores, men, at uh, Harvard in 1940. One of those, interestingly enough, was uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, and they tracked these people over the next and they're still tracking them it's been 81 82 years and uh they also at the same time got a group of boys from basically bowery boys from the from boston mm -hmm. and they tracked them as well so the initial question was is there a tie somewhere along the line to will will one group be happier than the other with the expectation that the group that had everything probably would be the happiest people um, and the group that came from the Bowery, and I'm using that loosely because I don't, it's not really true, but the group that came from this other area would be would be the ones that were sad. It did turn out that they ended up with two groups, two buckets of, of people. One was called the sad sick, and the other was called the happy well. Happy well. And so here's here are these seven factors on the answer to what's the difference between being sad sick or happy well. And, and the first one on the top of that is that you got to prioritize movement. You just Absolutely. got to keep moving. And we see it all over in, in the literature for sure about the need for walking. I think AARP publishes an article a day on, on the importance of walking. Um, I think some of the some of the more advanced stuff is showing that it's got to be more than walking. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but the idea of continuously moving, and that's kind of why if you have one of these Apple watches, how, how come it buzzes you every 20 minutes and says, get up and move. Uh -huh. um, so the next two are kind of obvious. Uh, watch your drinking. Yeah, don't smoke. And, and don't smoke. We've kind of known that since the 70s, right? Uh, uh, the Marlboro Man disappeared off the TV in 1970. So um, <laughs> the next one is developing some sort of a coping mechanism. Um, they, some of the things they talk about is uh, meditation, um, uh, exercise. Uh, exercise can be a great coping mechanism. But this idea of, of building the coping strategies, of, of building, of becoming uh, emotionally resilient and, and letting things roll off your back and not, uh, you know, stress is the killer ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. That's really what it's about. And, and then the next one is an idea of that you need to maintain a healthy weight. Uh, interestingly, there is a correlation between stress and, and a healthy weight uh, in terms of the chemicals that the body produces. Um, the next one is? Is, here, here we go again, stable long-term relationships. And, and this is actually the place that we're going to dig in a little bit yeah. uh, more today. We're going to talk about these four threads. But, you know, when you've got only a few minutes to, to talk about stuff, it's going to be kind of a skipping stone across a pond. And maybe actually, if you're interested, uh, give Paul a feedback or, or reach out to us. Uh, Paul, you can give people my email if you want. Um, and maybe we'll do some, some stuff around some of these things as well if people are interested. Um, and the last one is keep learning. I mean, I read something just recently about um, learning an, um, a musical instrument, picking up a new language, how important things like this are, and just keep learning throughout retirement. And I, I think that's uh, always been our deal. And that's actually why we're here today is because invariably what we are doing here, it comes directly from our learning, solving our own problem uh, that we had. How do we how do we transition into retirement? Well, and then uh, for those of you that teach, you know that the the best way to learn something is to have to teach it. So uh, it's kind of this 
this cycle that that revolves around. So uh, we're very. Elaine's joke is that if you ever see me standing on a corner with a cardboard sign, it will say, "We'll work for learning." That's really what <laughs> what I'm about. So it's true. So this again was a longitudinal study. It followed these cohort of people, this group of people. And over time, they've added additional people. There are just a handful of those original uh, 500 or so that started this study that are still alive. But over time, they've added their spouses, they've added in their children, um, and they continue to track this. There are now, they are now in their fourth director uh, of this study because over 80 years, you have to have a lot of different people in. Mm -hmm. The next study is one that y'all may be familiar with as well. Uh, it's called the uh, Blue Zones, and, and it was done by a guy named Dan Butner. Uh, Dan Butner applied for a National Geographic grant, and, and this is a different approach to this study, uh, to, the, to this kind of idea. What Butner said is, I want to go to places where people live to be over 100 years old, and, and I want to find out what it is about them that makes them live to be over 100 years old. And so, again, look at how these threads, these, these ideas from the first study lay over on top of what Butner found with the people. And by the way, he found five communities around the globe. Um, and if you haven't done this, there's a lot of, a lot of online. There's actually a, a nice little uh, TED Talk that he does about this as well. Um, but there are five places around the globe. One of them was in the U.S., and it's a Seventh-day Adventist community in Loma Linda, California, I think. But the rest of them are places like Okinawa and, and uh, uh, places where life is simpler for the most part. So the first idea, again, is this idea of movement, you know, um, make a daily, just be moving just be all moving. the time. Don't stop. And, and if you look at what he found in a lot of these places was Literally, that's a function of their lifestyle because they cannot not move because they're still doing kind of gathering, kind of hunting and gathering kind of approaches to life. The second one? The second one is is all about outlook, kind of like we talked about with, with Diane. I mean, she just had that, that can do, will do, you know, all her life. Uh, knowing your purpose. Um, I, I that was my that was my thing for my second phase of of a career was doing that thing I'd always wanted to do. Yeah, that purpose thing is is pretty huge. Um, it kind of goes with the uh, the exercise, the physical exercise is, is just to eat wisely. Note that uh, uh, a lot of these people uh, don't eat a lot of meat. Um, I, I don't know how much that would go well in America, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, and, this, and and of course, this drink a glass of red wine, I, I guess that's been your, in the news for your mom, your mom believes 100 in years. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is the one that again, we're really gonna we're gonna dig into here in a second is this need for belonging. And I don't know if y'all remember uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs was that little pyramid and the third tier up is about belonging. If you don't belong, it's very difficult to, to get uh, to, to be healthy in our society. Uh, I will point out that number eight there is connect, reconnect with religion. And again, remember, this is the five communities that he talked to. But ultimately, what he says about that is it's really about the sense of community, belonging to a sense of community more than it is any kind of a uh, an absolute requirement for some spiritual, uh, religious kind of affiliation. So, so based on that, we took that, those studies and a couple others, and we distilled out, we're kind of looking for, how do we make this easier? How do we make this, I, let's rephrase, how do we make this simpler? And we came up with these threads of fitness, these four threads of fitness. And what I mean by fitness is to improve your well-being, what's, what's appropriate for you, right? So um, we, we started working. And the reason we called them threads was because they weave together to form this tapestry of the quality of life. And they interact. They, they, they work together to give you the lift you need on that curve as well as to help you extend that curve. I, I guess I should uh, go back just for a second, talk to uh, Butner's work. He found that 
only 20% of our longevity was related to our genetics. So uh, I, I thought that was interesting. So 80% of it is being able to take control of your environment. And that's what we're looking at with these with this tapestry, uh, of these threads, I mean. So the first one is physical. And, and I'm sure we all remember the story of Ponce de Leon, who was on this quest to find the fountain of youth. And science actually tells us there is a fountain of youth. It's called nutrition and exercise. So Bob and I hired a trainer, our coach, Brant, who is a 47-year-old triathlete. Um, he's a certified nutritionist. He's also an OT and a PT, so he understands really well how to work with people our age. And the reason we did that is because we're in the process and we're being proactive about squaring our curve. And one of the areas that we needed his expertise was in that exercise and the nutrition. So, so remember, I told you simple but not easy. One of the things that that we have learned is that uh, walking is probably insufficient. It, I mean, it's great for you. It's great for you to get out socially, to meet people and all of that. But ultimately, if you look at what happens to us as we age, we tend to lose three to four to six pounds of muscle per decade after age 45, 50. So one of the things that we need to do, note that we bought a 30 pound kettlebell. <laughs> one of the things that we need to do is we need to do resistance training. And, and I, I, every time I think about that resistance training, I think they call it resistance training because I want to resist it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> uh, but we need to do resistance training, and also we need to be watching our nutrition on our proteins and, and mm -hmm. as well, because protein is what builds muscle. But the reason I'm harping on this is because uh, it's muscle loss that causes falls, it causes problems with balance, it causes all of the issues that we think about with people uh, that impacts their longevity. Um, so, so again, this is uh, the, the physical um, and, and nutritional component. Whoops, wrong slide. The second one is this idea of mental and emotional fitness. And as I said before, Paula has done, a, uh, and New Mexico New have done a fabulous job of bringing lots of people in to talk about um, the, the mental and emotional side. Um, you had uh, Paula, it was Paul Smith and Steve Pollard come in and talk yes. about uh, Martin Seligman's work. Martin Seligman is a guy that's one of the uh, best known of the positive psychologists. Uh, Seligman has a thing called well-being theory and a concept uh, that, that is called PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. It's an acronym. Again, there are two videos up on PERMA, right? Is that correct, Paula? Uh, correct. Correct. And, and so uh, I would point you to those because a lot of that is exactly and we know in this country right now, one of one of the big challenges is mental health. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it that that video is really good in terms of those videos and that concept, the Seligman concept are really good for thinking about how can I be more optimistic and how can I. Uh, be more positive uh, about what I'm doing. Another thing, just as a side, I noticed just this morning that a study came out of Texas A&M that says people who obsess on the news tend to be depressed and negative. I mean, it just literally, so don't watch too much news. How's that for <laughs> just being go. a sidebar pitch? <laughs> um, the other one that Paula ha has up is uh, um, Heather Robinson. Robertson? Heather Robertson, Robertson, yes. On the meditation, uh, did, a, did a lovely little uh, uh, session on mindfulness meditation, and uh, in, in our resources section, you'll see that a link to that as well as the stuff by John Kabat-Zinn on on mindfulness uh, meditation. Uh, there's tons of uh, mindfulness stress based reduction classes out there, kind of to help you get the mental state. And by the way. The threads all tie. I mean, ultimately, this idea of physical ties into our mental, emotional. The more physical exercise you do, the more optimism you have. Uh, the, the next one, spiritual. We called it spiritual. For us, it's not about religion. Um, it's about answering a bigger question. And the bigger question that we're trying to answer is, why am I here? What, what can I do that's meaningful? How can I make a contribution? Um, again, in the resources that we've given you, there are tons of things there. 
Um, I especially like a guy, his name is Richard Leiter. Uh, Richard Leiter has written dozens of books on, or not dozens, but many books on, on purpose, on finding your purpose. There's also a video up there he did uh, for MEA for the Modern Elder Academy, which is up in Santa Fe, uh, about finding purpose. Uh, one of my absolute favorite books is a really slim little book that Richard Leiter wrote, his first book called Claiming Your Place by the Fire, which, by the way, Paula, is where the idea of elders came from. Mm, where, interesting. Where I, where I copped that from initially, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, again, this this idea of ha- knowing your purpose is critical to to uh, your overall health and uh, to maintaining that optimistic uh, perspective. And then the last one. The last one is social. And I, I think we all accept that humans are social animals. Bob talked earlier about Maslow's hierarchy, that the third tier of it is all about a sense of belonging. And then one of the big takeaways, if you go back to that Harvard study, um, is that social interaction was one of the big things that they found as a result of that study and the importance of it. A matter of fact, um, Robert Waldinger, who's now the fourth director of that Harvard study, has done a, a TED talk. He did one in 2015 called What Makes a Good Life? It's only about 12 minutes long. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It is, it's fantastic. And he says that good relationships help us to be not only healthier, but happier, period. He said that that's the, the probably the number one lesson. He also went on to talk about loneliness and how toxic loneliness can be for us. He said it affects us not only physically, but mentally. And, and he went on to say that at any one time in America, one in five Americans states that they're lonely. So, so loneliness is an epidemic and, and loneliness is toxic. Here's a slide from another uh, TED talk uh, by Susan Panker. And one of the things that I think uh, think that was interesting here is, and, and I, if you read AARP or any of these things, you, this is not news to you, but, but to, to compensate for being lonely, it, you'd have to smoke 15 cigarettes a day. I mean, in other words, the, the impact of being lonely means that you would have to smoke 15 cigarettes a day. And, and I think that's just kind of stunning when you think about that. So um, that's where we want to dig in for the next few minutes. Now, is there anybody here that wasn't in my social capital class? I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I see a lot of, of familiar faces out there. Uh, I taught a class from maybe 2013 to maybe 2020, uh, 20, no, right before COVID, 2019, in social capital. And the idea of social capital is the idea that relationships are important to organizational performance. But you know, that social capital is also a thing about uh, us as humans. We, we need to have relationships. Relationships are important. So probably the premier guy writing out there right now about friendship um, and, and relationships is a guy named uh, Robin Dunbar. Robin Dunbar is a guy from, from England. Um, and he is a, I, I didn't even know this existed. He's an evolutionary psychologist, an evolutionary psychologist. So he studies people. And Dunbar is most famous for something called Dunbar's number, which says that we, uh, we as humans can only know well about 150 people. So if you look at this graphic here, you'll see that he gets out here to, to friends, this darkened ring out here. That's about 150 people. And his his rationale is that the neocortex, the part of the brain that makes us human, can only handle that many relationships. Now, Elaine, what's the sociology rule? Most of the people, most of the time. Okay, so so we all know people that know more than 150 people. We all know people that know less than 150 people. These are people you know well enough to say, hey, how's your kids doing? Would you like to have coffee with me next week? And there's anecdotal stuff that supports this science as well. Well, if you think about wedding lists, there's a, there's going to be about 150 people on it. If you think about funerals, that's generally about how many people you see there. 
So, so um, let's just differentiate for a second between what's a friend versus what's an acquaintance, because this is kind of important for our social structure. Structure. So, tell them our story. So we we moved about a, a year ago, and uh, we were talking to an acquaintance and we, telling him we were getting ready to move, and he said to us, "Whatever weekend it is that you're moving." I know I'm out of town. So that's the difference between a friend and an acquaintance. Uh, a friend, a true friend, is somebody that there's a sense of obligation. When 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 you need a shoulder to cry on, when you need somebody to talk to, when you need somebody to share ideas with, when you need someone, that's and, and that person says, I'm available. That's that's the difference between a friend. So let's dig in a little bit further into this, this Dunbar graphic. Um one of the things that you'll notice is at the center is because he's a psychologist, right? He can't say you are here. He has to say ego, ego, <laughs> ego is you. And notice that he's got that there are 1.5 people in your ego circle. This is a gender split. In general, men have one other person who's a soulmate or, or somebody who's a close, close, intimate uh, person. Women have one other person plus a BFF which Elaine tells me stands for best, best friend forever. forever. So that's why you have 1.5. So the, the next ring out then is a composite total of five people. So if there's two in your ego, this would be three other people. These are close friends. This is, this is what they call your support click. This is those group of people that you are most intimate with, that you share all kinds of secrets with, and you, and you share your woes and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is supported. If you actually think about, if you look at how many people you communicate with in text messages, how many people you regularly communicate with in, in uh, uh, Facebook pages or whatever it is, uh, social media you use, you'll see that it's four to five people, that it's this, this circle. As a matter of fact, 40% of our communications happen with people in this support click. So the next circle out, though, is, is best friends. And these are people who you still know quite well, uh, maybe you see less of, um, but, and, 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 and we call this your sympathy group. So this is a, this, the circle in the sympathy click is five people. The next circle out is 10 more people, so for a total of 15. The sympathy group is cleanly defined by people who you would be devastated if they passed away. That's really uh, a, a definition of it. What you may have heard is that this particular group is what we call strong ties. This is a strong ties. And, and what that means is these are people who you share, you know all about them, they know all about you. Um, there's a high trust bond in this particular uh, group of people that, that there's a, an, an immense amount of trust here. The outer circles, the acquaintances are what we call weak ties. And what weak ties add for you is they add uh, they add value by, by adding information. They give they can get access to information because the people you know well know all the same people you know. As a matter of fact, if you think about your your close friends group, if you think about your circle of five, it's likely that most of them know each other as well as you. Um, so they don't have any new information. The weak ties outside the circle is where you get new information. All right, so let's just take a second. Do we we have a chat window open up, Jillian? Paula, we got a chat window open up. All right. Yes. Think about yes. your inner circle. Think about your group of five or three or whatever it may be, because yes. sociology rules apply. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so just for a minute, think about what those people have in common. Why are they your BFFs? What about them? And type in the chat window just a, a word or two about why you think that they that you have this bond with them. Did you? Have you known them since you were in second grade? Um, do you guys have a passion for music? Um, um, is, is, you know... It, it, could be a hobby. It, it, and by the way, this could be family as well. Mm -hmm. Family is, is in your inner circle often as well. So um, have we got anything in the chat window? Um, somebody, uh, John Garcia said trustworthy. Uh, Lauren Soleil said known for a long time, family. Jay Eitzer said work together for 20 plus years, trust them, laugh with them. 
That's good. That's good. And, and, and let me just so comment on a couple of those things. Indeed, the trust thing is true, John. Um, it, it's a big deal. One of the things about that circle is that it changes over time. It morphs over time. So, Julie, you talked about, uh, you said about uh, uh, the, the work relationships, that you've worked with them for 20 years. Mm -hmm. When you retire, you no longer see those people at work anymore. And so the group tends to change, right? Um, and so there's always this function of proximity. If, if, you're, if people are near you, think about the people that you've known for a long time that are your best friends that move to another state and over a period of time that that kind of deteriorates. So again, that that circles morphing and, and moving in and out. Let me show you just what the science says, unless there's any other grand epiphanies there, Paula. Um, Paula said value, continue learning about ourselves. Another one said trust. Um, Roberto Minghetti said friends in school time. Carolyn Bennett said uh, creative. Fellow creatives. Oh, oh neat, neat, nice. neat. So, so let me show you what the science says. Behind door number two, what the science says. <laughs> so this comes out of the, um, out of the science as well. Um, there's what they call seven pillars of friendship. And I find this really fascinating because right now our country seems to be focusing on how we're different, not on how we're in common. We, we seem to be uh, uh, marking uh, things about how we disagree with each other than how we agree with each other. So note the seven pillars of friendship here. And what, what the science says is that you need to truly have a deep, deep friendship. You need to match up a line on three of these seven. And by the way, my slides are posted in the, in the, um, in the resources. In the resources. Uh, they'll, uh, so I assume you guys will supply those to people if they want. Yes, we will. We and will. so you'll be able to read these on the slides. Uh, but the first one is. Well, the first one is same language or dialect. I, I, we were we were talking about this. We were on vacation, and there was a man from Tennessee who ran into a woman who was from Texas, and so they had this big conversation and started up this friendship over that their accents were very similar. I mean, it it can be as as simple as something like that. And, and every other word was y'all. Right? Y'all, yeah. Y'all. And they blessed each other's hearts. <laughs> Bless each other. Talk. So, so the second thing, and we heard some of this, was growing up in the same location. Now, Elaine and I are military brats. We grew up all over the world. And so while we don't have a common location with people, we do have a common life experience mm -hmm. that, that tends to bond us. It actually uh, opens some interesting discussions about, you know, where were you stationed? Who do you know? Uh, the next one is this idea of similar educational or career experiences, which is what Julie had talked about, this idea of career experiences. Um, we often bond, those of us that have been through uh, educational programs have colleagues that go back decades because we went through that experience with them. Uh, hobbies and interests? Well, I, I after I retired, I took up quilting i mean it can that that can be its own little community you know in and of itself um we see it in in our neighborhood there's a group of artists that have this this strong bond over whatever it is that they're creating so the the next one is the same worldview moral religious and political views bob kind of touched on that already um same sense of humor i i think this is this is uh, Bob's had me laughing for 40 plus years. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm thinking there's one of my buddies out here right now that that I, I love the sense of humor. I, I, I just did. I suspect other people look at us and go, you guys are just weird. But I, I do. <laughs> and you know who you are, man. So, that, yeah. And then the last one that fascinated me as well was this idea that you, that you would have the same musical taste. But I do think about that. Um, if if you want to bond with me. You probably don't want to invite me to a rap concert. I'm probably <laughs> not going to do that. Um, and so these are the seven pillars. And again, remember what they found was you need to, you, if for a really close friend, three of the seven actually should be in common. From a uh, psychology standpoint, this is called homophily. Homophily, the idea that we like others who are just like us. Um, so I wanted to show you that to think about. As you look to meet new people, what might be the things that you have in common? And there's also a, a, an organization out there right now that I think is doing some incredible work 
called more in common. More in common is actually recognizing that we've kind of come apart, that we've polarized as a country. And it's starting to help people think about what they have more in common rather than what their, their difference are. So I, I just think that's a neat idea. All right, another so, ditty. And so this, this, is, this is actually another Diane-ism. She, she used to kind of sing this around the house, make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other gold. So anytime we talk about relationships with people, they always ask us uh, invariably about how do I, well, how do I find new friends? I mean, or how do I rekindle friendships? And I think this has become especially relevant uh, post COVID. I mean, there are friends of mine who I would say were strong ties that were very close. And I haven't seen them since before COVID now. Um, they, they kind of have become dormant ties in the sense that I haven't really, I connect with them via text messaging or whatever, but but I haven't been able to, uh, to get, but people ask, well, what about new friends? And so we thought we just, we, I, we thought we'd meddle a little bit in that. Um, so I always kind of get in my head, who are the people you've yet to meet? In other words, who are the friends you've yet to make? And, and with that kind of mentality, when I'm out and about, I actually... I actually am a little more open to interacting with people than I might be if I was just out shopping for underwear and I'm not going to look up before I get home. Right. And so okay. Elaine and I came up and we're wrapping up right now, Paul, are we close to being good? Okay. Um, Elaine and I came up with these six ideas. Again, we are, we were raised military brats and that meant that every 18 months you were plucked from whatever community you had already joined and you were moved into a new place where you probably knew nobody. And so uh, when you grow up like that, you either become a wallflower or you kind of engage, you figure out ways to engage. Mm -hmm. The first rule we came up with, and by the way, there's no science here. We just made these up. So be aware of that. This was a Bob and Elaine coffee conversation one morning. So the first one is cross the threshold. And I, when we started talking about this, I told Bob, yeah, I have yet to meet somebody sitting in our living room <laughs> it hasn't it just hasn't happened i i've often thought that i i want a t-shirt that says court serendipity right mm -hmm. court serendipity and i know this absolutely you can't run into new ideas and you can't run into new people sitting on your couch mm -hmm. you got to get across the threshold this is the first rule of exercise too you got to cross the threshold the second one is this idea of go where the people are and and we gave you a little bit of a clue with those with those seven pillars of thinking about what you're interested in, what where people with other uh, the same interests might be, so uh, where they are. But we have a couple of examples. Yeah, in, in our last neighborhood, we loved the two examples that we had for this. The first one is Ike. Ike lived across the street from us, and every morning about eight o'clock, up went his garage door, and he would drag a lawn chair out, and he'd sit right there in his garage, and he talked to everybody that went down the street. And then the second part of his strategy was the community mailbox was directly in front of his house. So if you went out to get your mail or drop something in to be mailed, you were having a conversation with Ike. Then the second example we had was a neighbor, Joe, who actually lived around the corner. And he, every morning, even though towards the end there, he was walking around with a walker, he made two laps every morning, every afternoon, you knew you were going to see Joe and he was going to be stopping and talking to people and he knew everybody's names. He even got to the point where he was keeping little dog treats in the pocket off the side of his walker because he also knew everybody's dogs. So understand Ike is in his mid eighties and Joe is in his mid nineties. Mid Joe was actually a world war II vet that flew in the Pacific theater. And so these guys are still exercising. Ike is a, as a gatherer, right, where he's <laughs> sitting in his garage gathering people, people and and uh, Joe as a hunter, where he's literally going around the neighborhood. And, you know, his walk, his daily walk, there were 62 houses in that community. His daily walk took him several hours to get around because he would stop here and there. The third one is be accessible. Smile at people. I yeah. mean, good <laughs> Lord. You know, there's there's an old joke about economists, and I am one, so that's why I'm going to tell this joke, that how do you tell an outgoing economist? And the answer is he stares at your shoes when you talk when you talk to him, you know, uh, and, and so smile and be accessible. Um, the fourth one we ripped off straight out of improv. Any of you have ever done an improv class, 
No, no. The first rule of improv is just say yes. Just say yes. And we had an example of this down the street. One of our neighbors, her husband passed away. And she told me that her son told her, whatever invitations you get, mom, just say yes and then show up. Um, and she actually said it's been the smartest advice she got in the entire process because it's just helped keep her going. Now, now this is one we've really had to work on as well because we we tend to be homebodies. And I, I know some of you out there uh, are out every night, out and about every night. We tend to, and it was a habit that we developed during work. We would come home and just boom, you're just there. Oh. You don't move. That's it. Um, and and so we kind of still are homebodies. We don't typically go out, you know. And increasingly, it's like I don't drive after dark kind of excuses, <laughs> uh, which is tougher in the summer. People are like, it doesn't get dark till nine. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, some some a month ago or so, uh, the the chamber exec out here. Uh, I was having lunch with him and he gave me, he said, here, I got some tickets for you. You'll like this. And it was tickets to Grand Funk Railroad. I don't know if any of you remember <laughs> Grand Funk Railroad. Grand Funk Railroad was a band that I saw in the 70s. I mean, uh, the, the interesting thing was uh, they played music that wasn't their hits when I went to see them the first time. They had uh, That's how long they've been around. Yeah. Uh, but I, honest to God, I, I came home and I told Lane, I said, he gave us these tickets. I it's down at Isleta. We're going to have to drive all the way to Isleta. It's going to be dark. We we thought about renting a room down there. I mean, it was like, but you know what? We went and and it actually was a good show. And, and accountability wise, it was good that we showed because he was there. Mm -hmm. It was fun. Yeah. Although the difference between being 18 or 17 and, and the difference between being in your 60s is we should have taken earplugs. We really should have taken earplugs. <laughs> But showing our age. The next one is is this idea of take small risks. Uh, I, I'm always amazed at how people are afraid to smile and talk to other people. Um, I I think people want to engage, and it's really easy to to find things to talk about uh, to people. You know, mentioned uh, I like your tie or something like that. People just want to, and there's different levels that one can talk to. You know, um, we all have the it's a fine weather or I hope it rains, whatever kind of thing. Um, but Elaine is good at taking small risks. I, I well, I, I told him a story about, I'm trying to remember, I think we were, uh, we just moved to Georgia. My dad was stationed at a base there. And I, it, it's the first week of school. I don't know anybody yet. It's recess. I'm by myself. And about a week later, I, I, we get a new student. Um, her name was Mary Beth Back. And so she's at one end of the playground. I'm at the other end and we're both alone. And so one day I worked up all of my courage and I went over and asked her if she wanted to do the swings with me for a while. And so I mean, just little things like that, just putting yourself out there to, you know, meet somebody new. And, and the last one we we got here is uh, straight out of uh and Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie. It's a Dale Carnegie rule. I mean, that book was written in 1934, <laughs> and yet it's still got some incredibly sage things in it. Uh, what Carnegie talked about in that book, and by the way, it's been updated, so it's not these 1930s examples, but what he talked about was this idea that we tend to be self-centered. We tend to be uh, self, uh, you know, self-centric. And so we got the memes. We're always talking about me, 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 me when we talk to people. And so his contention is, is that you need to be cognizant of that and make you turns. In other words, ask them questions about you. And, and there are some people in this room today who are masters of this skill, mm -hmm. making you turns, uh, getting people to talk about themselves, to share about themselves. The astounding thing about that is if you do that well, people will leave and go, man, that guy that I just met was fascinating, <laughs> even though all they did was talk about themselves. And, and probably the Last rule, I think, we didn't put on here is don't be a jerk. I mean, good Lord, don't be a jerk. I mean, if, <laughs> be if, nice. If somebody I, says hello, say hello. I say be, I just say be nice, be kind. Well, I, I cleaned it up. So there. <laughs> so, Paula, we are there. Um, okay. We, we probably uh, stepped by a bunch of stuff we wanted to talk about, but uh, but we're in it 45 minutes, 46 yes. minutes. Yes, yes. Yes, and thank you, Bob and Elaine. So great. Good. And I laughed. Several times. <laughs> I, I always know that too, Elaine, your husband, Bob, I, whenever I talk with him on the phone or in person, he has made me laugh. 
Always. That is yeah. always the challenge, though, with the uh, Brady Bunch Zoom audience, right? Yes. Everybody's in a little <laughs> box and you can't see, you know, whether people are having fun or not. You can't, you got no audio feedback, <laughs> right? Can I, can I just say really quickly, thank you so much to everyone who, who joined us today. It was yes. lovely to, to get little glimpses and hear everything that um, everyone added in on the, the, in the chat box. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. John Garcia just said, you guys rock. I agree. <laughs> I agree. And especially Grand Funk Railroad. That was my first <laughs> concert in high school at Tingley Coliseum. I don't know that I would have. So I, you're encouraging me to get out because I probably would have said mm, no, but I would have known to take earplugs because yeah. We but couldn't find them. Paul, we couldn't that find was the them. problem. We found them after we got home. Yeah. yeah. A little late, but yeah. <laughs> that's great. It was a well, good so time. I want to know, has anybody got some questions? And I'll I'll start, but I would love for people to put their, either raise your hands or put your uh, question in the chat and then we'll call on you. But the first one is you brought up purpose a couple of different times. And it, for me, it's been, and I've asked people, I ask this people this question a lot, is how do you find your purpose? If some people know it. I got it. Others say, well, it comes to me and it changes. I mean, what do you guys think about finding your purpose? So so uh, one of the books that's on our list, um, I can't remember the author's name. Um, it's by uh, Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. It's called Designing Your Life. Mm -hmm. and, and the second part of it is how to build a well-lived, joyful life. And uh, if you don't want to read a book, go to Arthur Brooks. Uh, Arthur Brooks does a podcast on happiness, and he interviews these guys. Um, the, the reason I bring that up is that now these guys are two Stanford guys that work for the design labs in Stanford. And, and, and uh, so they use a design process for, for this. And one of the things that they point out is that there's this old axiom that you hear, um, I was trying to remember where it came from, but they say, follow your bliss. You should follow your bliss, right? And, and they said the data says that 20% of the people know what their bliss is. The rest of the people have no idea what their bliss is. They have to go find it. And so there are a ton of different exercises, Paula. Um, in, we do one in, in the workshops we do where we use a, a series of cards that uh, Richard Leiter developed. Um, and you work through that as card decks and yeah. ultimately it helps you define your top five things that you're passionate about. And then you begin to work around that. that mm -hmm. That's the start for it. Um, there are dozens of different purpose exercises. And uh, yeah. remember too, that really life is about the questions we ask. So you've got to make sure you're asking the right questions here mm. as well so well, i'd also say that it's something that i i have to do kind of regularly because it, it changes it it's it's changed twice since i retired in 2019 this yeah. pursuing something different at at different times yeah and, and and going with that i mean that's uh something that we kind of get we tend to get twisted up on is that kind of the who am I next thing is that this is who I am. This is my identity. you got to remember there are multiple facets to your identity. And so we should explore the various places and explorations are cheap to do. I mean, from a design learning perspective, uh, do little experiments. You don't have to say, okay, uh, tomorrow I'm going to go to college to become a nuclear physicist at age 60 and then, and then find out that age 70, you, you hate it, right? Do mm -hmm. little experiments, take yeah. small risks. Yes. Yes. Yeah. A good, good answer. And, and I think um, with, with both the purpose, I've seen a couple of different resources. I'll add one to that modern elder Academy has that it's a purpose course that's online, um, but I'll add it to your resource list. If I can get an editable copy and then the creative aging. So you brought up the flourishing course and the like, uh, that's the Center for Applied Positive Psychology that actually Larry Ali turned us in onto New Mexico New, and they've done some great courses for us, as you referenced. There's one starting out of uh, Eastern New Mexico University, the Rio Doso branch, I believe. Oh, and that is a creative aging course that I will also put in your resource list before we send it out, because it's just starting, I think, next week or uh, early in September. 
it's only thirty dollars, but it's a uh, actually taught great course. So one of one of the things that you can add for us too, Paula, is uh, Elaine referenced the Robert Waldinger um, TED Talk. Yes, and I don't believe that I put that in the resources. Okay. And that is that is a fabulous talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll do. All right, we have a question from Don Don Allen. Hello. Hey, Don. <clears throat> Thank you all so much for a wonderful presentation. Oh, you're welcome. I don't know if I would be able to attend today, but I laughed as well. And you <laughs> all are just such a joy. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> you talk today. Well, thank um, you. I had a ditto uh, as, along with Paula as far as the purpose, finding your purpose. Um, so... My situation is I feel like I've been retired for 30 years because 30 years ago I had an injury and illness that ensued since then. So just within the past couple of years, I feel like I've been, I've come out of a coma. So I'm just trying to kind of find my way and find my purpose at this point um, at a retirement age. Um, so I wanted to ask, I saw the book in the, in the chat. Is that the book on purpose of designing for life? I, I don't, I can't see chat, so I don't know. It, it, pop, it but, is, but, it, it is in, it is in the chat, Don. I saw it, uh, it popped up earlier, the link for it. So again, just to be sure, it's by uh, Bill Burnett and Dave, Dave Evans. Evans. It's called Designing Your Life, How to Build a Well-Lived, Joyful Life. And uh, I would tell you, go and watch some of their videos. Uh, to, this is a, it's, this is a working book. Um so it's one of those things where you read a chapter and do some exercises. And frankly, you could read the whole thing and just blast through. But if you don't do the exercises, and they are incredible exercises, yeah. you would not take this away as much. Right. And then the podcast, who did you say that was? Follow so the, your bliss. Uh, well, the follow your bliss is, is comes from uh Joseph Campbell, Joseph Campbell uh, but yeah. but uh, the uh, the guys that they talk so the interview is done with a guy that wrote Strength to Strength. His name is Arthur Brooks. Brooks. He writes for the Atlantic Magazine, and uh, he's he's got a he's got an incredible book out, Strength to Strength, talking yeah, about that's a great book. Moving great. to your second curve mm -hmm. and all of that. As a matter of fact, Elaine and I do a book study group, mm -hmm. um, and we bring in people from all around the country, and we did that as one of our book Brooks. studies. So to answer your question, um, it's it's one of Arthur Brooks podcasts. Arthur Brooks has several podcasts, so I don't know which it is. Ultimately, Arthur Brooks is writes uh, writes and uh, and talks about happiness, about being happy as we age and our happiness. Uh, so it'll have something like happiness in the title of it. Right, um, right. And in your resource list, uh, you put the link for the Chip Conley interview of Albert Brooks, which is great. Okay. Great one. So, the, um, Don, when we send out the resource list, you'll have at least the start of that first interview. And and hopefully, I just I, I did call him Albert. I, I might have just called him Arthur. That's the actor, right? Albert Brooks. No, it's Arthur Brooks. Oh, it's Arthur. Brooks. Arthur. Arthur wrote the, uh, wrote okay. the book. It's Arthur. I get that confused all the time. Yeah, me too. I think <laughs> Albert is the actor, right? Actor. <laughs> it's the one that made the actor. How yes, about that? There we go. <laughs> yep. Don, okay. thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Really Don. enjoyed it. Very good information. Um, I'll follow, um, you know, some of the, the the points that you all brought out about the exercise and I'm working on my social circle and everything. So I feel like I've welcomed you all into my social circle at this thank point. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> we, we may, thank, thank you. We may actually put some events together. Um, so we'll keep people posted on those as well. Okay. Yeah, great. And I'll stay in touch with Paula. She'll keep me posted. We work together at DEC what 40 years ago Paula <laughs> yes indeed it was a long time ago long time ago yep so all right okay, you all have a great rest of your day and thank you again thank you Don. thank you all right we have another question from Shannon I'm gonna add you there's the Shannon oh no <laughs> hi Paula hello I didn't want to do that <laughs> there's Shannon there's Shannon but I want to add you guys sorry about that there we go. Hi, Shannon. If you want to unmute and ask your question. I, I really didn't have a question. I'm sorry. I pushed the wrong button, but I'm ah. always, 
enjoyed your presentation. I particularly like the part about trying to find your purpose. That's that's very that's very important when you're lost. So thank you for your presentation. Oh, thank you. Make sure thank you, you look at that here. at that resource list, Shannon, because there's some really um, incredible people out there. There's a nice video up with the Modern Elder Academy of Richard Leiter talking about purpose, um, and and so that might be fun to do. Plus, Elaine and I, if we do our workshops again, do do quite a bit of work around purpose. Do do. You said do do. do. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels like do do, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This, this is how our day goes. We just laugh all day long. Why I have these laugh lines? <laughs> but we won't be playing ukuleles today. No, no ukuleles. 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 We have to learn how to say it if we're going to play it. Yeah. Ook. <laughs> Ook. All right. Anybody else have a question? I, I have a comment. I, I'm Larry Ali. I'm uh, the chair of the board here at New Mexico New, and I just want to thank everybody for participating. Of course, it's great to see some of you uh, old friends. And uh, just a, a, a reflection, as I've been involved with Encore careers and, and retirement, um, what I notice is that this is a decision we make on our own for the most part. And we don't have, we can't ask our parents to help us or our boss or our whomever, you know, there's always a guide through life until now. Uh, so I would just emphasize that the social aspect is important, not only for interpersonal empathy and belonging, but I think it's a great conversational place to go through the journey. It, you, you have to do it yourself, but you don't have to do it alone. And the conversations themselves can help one ferret out purpose, and figure out skills you have that you may not even know you have because you're reflecting off of others. So it's part of New Mexico News vision to have um, this opportunity to to have a community aspect to what we do and a conversational aspect. And I just want to thank uh, Bob and Elaine. Great job. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. You do remember, Larry, when we first started this because you were at day one, pretty much, right, that uh, we talked with Alan Weber specifically about this idea of developing community. And, and that was one of the big goals here with New Mexico New and all, all of us was this sense of community, this idea of building community. Um, we had kind of hoped to do some of that kind of, Alan's little uh, antidotal kind of, uh, his, his metaphor was build it like uh, AA groups, right? Little AA groups where people are around supporting each other. But then COVID happened, man. And I think we all have that tale of the, the PC, you know, pre-COVID and BC, uh, or BC and after COVID, BC and AC, yeah. whatever. Yeah, before uh, COVID and after COVID. Yep. Yeah, but but I, I I hear you, man. This to me is exactly mm -hmm. why we need community uh, is is because uh, it's where we find our ideas. It's we, where we find our support. Uh, it's it's where we find our way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Larry, for for um, being the, volunteering time to be a board member, and really from the very start helping with New Mexico New, and um, and he the reason we had all those great center for applied positive psychology through his uh, connection to Steve. So yay! All right, well, thank you, Bob and Elaine, again. I'll also add on, and especially on your anniversary when we chose this date, <laughs> Bob and Elaine said that's my that's our anniversary. I said, it's do you okay. really want? Yeah, and and they said I couldn't think of a better thing to do because it's part of your passion and the passion that you share together, which I think is very important to also have us um, thrive in life. Um, so I just I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having us in. Very much appreciate. Yeah, really appreciate it. So let me go through just the final things. I want to make sure people take the survey. If you can help us out, Jillian put the link in the chat. And if you're like me, I'm on these Zooms. I hit that link, it'll open a browser window and it won't disturb your Zoom. But then suddenly you'll get at the end of the Zoom and you'll close that browser window without taking the survey. So we are, we are really working to get funding, especially for this application that will make it easy for us to get connected to part-time supplemental work and or volunteer work in our community. 
And so this is a part of the data we need to show funders and, and to show to the community that it is something that we think we want, right? I don't, we don't want to do it unless there's support. Right now, this is showing that there's support. But if you could go to the survey, three quick questions. Are you currently working? Are you currently searching and planning to work to supplement your income? Would you find an application that connects you to that? And, and especially age-friendly businesses that you would not have to look for by yourself. Would you find that useful? And three, would you be willing to pay a, a membership fee? And it would be a small membership fee, but would you be willing to? And then again, thank you, Bob and Elaine. We will send out the resource list from all of the resources. Thank you, Jillian, for posting those in the chat as we went. We will send you out a file that has all those and a link to the recording of this so that you can look at, and a copy of your PDF slides, Bob. So we'll include those in there too. Perfect. All right, and thank you again to our sponsors. We could not do this without our sponsors, especially AARP New Mexico, French Funerals and Cremations, and Nusenda. Stacy Sacco at uh, NM Netlinks helps get us connected, and at the one uh, Albuquerque, Anna Sanchez from Senior Affairs, and then Cumulus Media. So thank you so much. And again, we look, we're look we starting to look for sponsors, and we continue to look for sponsors. If you know somebody we you think would be a good one, let us know. And then here's the application we talked about. We're currently seeking funding for that. If you know of an organization that would be great to contribute, please let me know. And then our final uh, of 2022 will be in October. We don't have a date yet. Oh, we don't have a date yet, but we have, and this is someone I also laugh with is Judge Christy Carbongal. She's, we are very fortunate to have her as our Bernalillo County probate judge. She's going to talk about what kind of things you need to have prepared so you don't have to see her if you died or your partner. And, um, and she is hilarious also. So, she, and then uh, we hope to have Mark again from French talk about um, the final preparations you can do. We don't have a date yet set, but we will have it on our website soon and registration available soon. All right. So with that, please answer the survey and, um, and uh, we appreciate everybody coming today. Again, fabulous uh, event. Uh, we, we could have Bob and Elaine back because I know they have lots more to talk about. They just skimmed the surface of all of what they have to share with